Hello, everybody, and welcome to Strive's Q&A on the topic of the novel coronavirus. Our guests today are Dr. Amesh Adalja, who is Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins University Center for Health Security. His work is focused on emerging infectious disease, pandemic preparedness, and biosecurity. Our other guest is Dr. Gregory Salmiri, who is the co-editor with Alan Gotthilf of A Companion to Ayn Rand, an Anthem Foundation Fellow in Philosophy, and a part-time lecturer in philosophy at Rutgers University. The purpose of our Q&A today is firstly to um, ask Dr. Adalja some questions about the nature of this disease. It's uh, precautions that people should be taking about it. There's a lot of information circling around, some true and some false, and um, I am excited to have Dr. Adelja on here to um, bring the, the facts on these matters to light and to answer any questions that our participants have. And this uh, this coronavirus and the responses of government to it raise some really interesting uh, ethical questions about when a quarantine is warranted and such. So we will um, be discussing that with Dr. Salmiri. And now without any further ado, um, I, let's get started. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you can either raise your hand in your Zoom browser or you can type them you can type them directly into the chat and we will call on whoever um, raises their hand or types their question first does anybody want to go first Okay, um, in that case, I guess I will ask the first question. Um, so I have heard uh, various things about the efficacy of masks in helping to prevent the spread of disease. Uh, there's currently a severe mask shortage. It's been near impossible to buy them in my area since about mid to late January and just people are in a buying frenzy for these products. Um, I, I've heard various kind of information on, on their effectiveness, and I'm not sure uh, what, to, what to believe exactly. I think that from what I've heard, surgical masks are not that effective, while N95 respirator masks can be somewhat effective from shielding somebody from the effects of a cough or sneeze. And I would like to hear your thoughts on that, Dr. Adelja. Okay, sure. So there are a couple different masks, the surgical masks and the N95 masks. And the general recommendation now is that the general public does not need to wear masks. And I'll explain where that recommendation comes from. So a surgical mask is the kind that you've seen lots of people wear in the hospital where it kind of loops around your ears and comes around the mouth and it covers your mouth and your nose. When we do use those in the hospital, Tom, and I was wearing one earlier today in the hospital. So you do wear those when there are people that have a respiratory viral infection and it's spread by droplets that go about six feet and then fall to the ground. And the rationale is that the, that, that mask may prevent that from happening, as well as the fact that you can sometimes use those on individual patients who themselves are coughing and sneezing and then that stops them from spreading it. But what happens is in the general public, when they're wearing them out, I've often, they don't often wear them very well. They're loose fitting. Sometimes people keep their nose out from underneath them. Sometimes people stick their hand in to touch their face underneath the mask. So they don't really provide that same type of benefit in the general public uh, setting. And the, the problem is right now we're in a crisis and hospitals need those. So the panic buying has become a major issue uh, for ensuring that our supply chain is going to work. And we're really nervous about, about having a supply chain issue. And there is something kind of scary called the Defense Production Act, where the government can basically make companies make masks if they want them to. Uh, and where I'm really nervous about this panic buying actually leading to the president to exercise that clause of the Defense uh, Powers Act. And they've already made a contract with 3M to make more masks because there's such a shortage. So I do think it's, there's more than just the fact that it's not, it just doesn't work that well. It's not that efficient. It's kind of a waste of time for most people to wear them. It's also this idea that this shortage is going to create 
a big problem down the line. When it comes to N95, so we use those in the hospital when we take care of a patient with tuberculosis, for example, when the transmission is through very, very small particles, what we call airborne particles that can say suspended in a room, not like the droplets that go to the ground. If you've ever worn an N95 mask, it's not a very comfortable thing to do. I can't keep one on for maybe like two, more than two minutes before I start to feel uncomfortable because you're breathing. It's so impermeable to anything, it's, it's kind of stifling to wear. So that's also something that we don't recommend individuals to wear. And it's actually can be sometimes hazardous to people's health if they don't know that they have a, maybe have a breathing problem, a lung problem. We've, there's been studies of people where they, they look at their blood chemistry wearing an N95 and it alters because the carbon dioxide and ox levels and oxygen levels change in your blood. So I would just say wearing an N95 for a long time is not, not necessarily safe. And I don't think it's something that the general public should be wearing that the risk outweighs the benefit. The, the basic way actually just wash your hands more and touch your face less. And if someone's coughing or sneezing towards you, turn your head. That's the best thing you can do. I think that the masks really distract you from what's going on. And the fact is that they're in, in scarce supply. And I'm, I'm very nervous that we're going to have supply shortages in hospitals, which is going to turn into a real mess if that happens. I hope that sort of answered what, what, uh, what you're asking. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you for your answer. Um, I see that there have been several questions posted here um, in the chat. I see that Jordan has pre-submitted his questions, although I was not able to see his email. And because his questions seem to be more about identifying what exactly this new illness is, I think let's ask these questions before getting to Rob's question. Also, there's Ricardo with a hand. Oh, and Ricardo, um, raise your hand. Yeah. Well, let's start with Jordan. Okay. Yeah, Ricardo, um, you'll be in the line too. So just, you want me to go down these, these Jordan questions one by one? I see them yes. there. Yes. Okay, so the first one is, in terms of the degree of infectiousness and the intensity of the symptoms, what distinguishes COVID-19 from regular influenza? So this is a common question because we're using influenza as a comparator. A couple of main big facts. So influenza and coronaviruses are two different viral families. So they share some characteristics, but they're genetically very distinct. But they both cause upper respiratory infections. So that's kind of why they're grouped together. And they are both spread through the droplet route primarily, meaning coughs and sneezes. And they both cause very similar symptoms. So what distinguishes it in terms of infectiousness? I think it's probably about the same in terms of infectiousness as flu, that the average person maybe infects two or more people uh, with this that, that has it. So the infectiousness is pretty much the same. What the, the intensity of the symptoms, what we're finding now is, is that this virus, just like flu, has the capacity to cause a spectrum of illness from very mild upper respiratory symptoms like coughing, sneezing, a sore throat, to more severe illness like pneumonia and, and in, in rare cases, death. We still don't quite know what the case fatality ratio is. We know that it, it's happening, but we don't know how frequent it is. So for regular influenza, it's about 0.01% of people who get influenza will die from it. And that's, that's a pretty low number, but it adds up because influenza is so infectious. So that's why we have tens of thousands of deaths every year in the United States. When it comes to the 1918 flu, for example, that was just a 1% fatality rate, but because of it, so it was so infectious and spread around the world, that's why we had 50 to 100 million deaths. Right now, my best guess at the, the fatality, it's not, my, not really a guess, but looking at it, it's probably more dangerous than the normal seasonal influenza. I don't know how much more. I think the case fatality rate's going to be less than 1% probably closer to around 0.6% is where the, is the best estimate we have right now based on the data in South Korea because they're testing so extensively that we're getting these mild cases where in China, they're focused so much more on the, on the severe cases. So it's caused what's called, what's called a severity bias. When you're looking in the early days of an outbreak, the things that are gonna come to light first are the sickest cases. So it's gonna skew the data. And it's not that the data is false or anything. It's just that it's not complete, giving you a complete picture because they're only testing people that come to attention. And the mild people who have just have a runny nose aren't going to be out there, but in South Korea, They've gotten very aggressive, and that's why I think you've seen their case fatality ratio fall. So that's kind of where I think it falls there. Next question. How many intensive care patients can the U.S. system accommodate? Uh, will COVID-19 challenge that capacity? So it's unclear what the capacity is for dealing with intensive care unit patients because hospitals get creative when they get crunched, so they can sometimes convert other beds to ICU beds, use uh, step-down units, for example, in other parts of the hospital to house ICU beds. And during H1N1, during the 2009 pandemic, we did get challenged and we had to be creative with bed space, but we were able to handle it. And I do think COVID-19 is going to challenge that capacity. 
it's unclear yet. How, again, this is, goes back to the first question that you asked. We don't quite know the case fatality ratio, and we don't quite know the severity level. So we know, do, do know that there are patients in the United States right now in intensive care units that are pretty sick, and we've had deaths. But we don't know how much the U.S. capacity can, can absorb those. I do think we're going to be stretched thin, but that capacity is going to be in flux. So it's not an easy answer to make, and it's something that we're actually trying to figure out now in terms of uh, bed capacity. What's the next one? At what point should one seek admission to a hospital if experiencing symptoms? For a healthy young person, is self-quarantine and self-treatment a realistic option? So I think that you should, it's just very general types of stuff to say. So if you are somebody that's elderly, if you are somebody that has medical conditions that puts you at higher risk for a severe complication, so maybe you have lung disease, maybe you have severe asthma, maybe you've had an organ transplant or, or a bone marrow transplant, all of those types of things put you at higher risk for having a severe case. So I would have a lower threshold to, to look at, to get evaluated by a medical professional, especially if you're having unremitting fever, shortness of breath, lethargy, but most people, especially healthy young people are going to be able to just handle this at, fine at home. And you don't, don't even need to be admitted that you can just treat this like a cold or a bat or a flu that you've had in the past, take over the counter medications and keep track of your symptoms. So I do think that you're going increasingly going to see more people self-isolate and self-treat. And that's what's happening uh, around the country. As we know that most of these cases are going to be mild. All right. What's the next one? Well, let's see. As a general so social distancing practice, should asymptomatic persons visiting elderly grandparents, I think that most of the transmission is occurring in people who actually have symptoms when they're coughing and sneezing. I do think if you have symptoms, you probably should not be visiting an elderly grandparent. If you don't have any symptoms, I think, I think you're probably fine to visit an elderly grandparent. I don't think there's much transmission that goes on. I would be mindful though uh, of it, um, but I wouldn't necessarily change my behavior uh, based on what we know about what the thrust of transmission is. But I do think you should you know, wash your hands more and touch your face less in general. And, and especially if you're an elderly person, you should be very cognizant of who you're, whose hands you're shaking and, and what you're doing uh, because of the, the risk, the higher risk that they have. Uh, there's a lot of these, Please, they keep getting more. Please explain the U.S. legal quarantine process. If I fly to China this summer, for example, can, will the government put me into quarantine? If so, what does that involve? Are I charged to bill? Am I charged to bill? Okay, so this is all evolving and changing really rapidly because in the beginning, this is kind of a larger story. In the beginning, many people believed that this virus could be contained, or at least that's what they were trying to, to, to operate on the assumption of. And that's where all those quarantine, quarantine orders came from, is that this was a containable virus, that this was something that we could keep out of this country. And that's why they were take, people who came back from China were getting sent to Air Force bases or being asked to self-quarantine in home. There, initially, the government tried not to do, they tried to do this voluntarily. They just said, let's just do this. And most people agreed to it. Um, and then one guy tried to leave in California. So then they had California, the state issue a quarantine. So both the state and the federal government can issue quarantines. The federal government rarely issues quarantines. They usually leave it to the states or local governments to do that, but they can do that. And really it has to be in general, my view on quarantines is that it's the last resort when somebody has really proved that they're not, that they're going to put other people at risk. I don't necessarily think it should be the first action that you do, even with like typhoid Mary. They didn't, they didn't put her on that island until she actually disobeyed like 15 orders when they voluntarily said, you're fine, just, just don't cook, don't cook, don't cook. And she continued to do that and hide and change her name. That's why they had to do that. So I think that's the best way to do it. Do I think that the quarantine was warranted for people coming back from China? No, because it's a respiratory virus, spreads efficiently. It had been going on in China since November. So there was no way that this was going to be stopped. And those quarantines were more, this was more the president's idea and the White House's idea versus what the CDC actually recommended. There's actually a good article in the New York Times today talking about that internal discussion that happened. And we knew that was going on, at least in my field, that there was a lot of controversy over that because it didn't make sense. It's actually one of the actions not recommended during an outbreak is these travel bans. And, and they didn't do that during H1N1, and it made sense not to do that. They didn't do that during Ebola, they didn't do, they, and, but they did this for, for China. So what they've done is banned any entry of anybody that's a, a non-US national from China. And if you are an American citizen, you have to go into a 14 day quarantine period and they're putting basically in putting people on air force bases and doing that. So I think right now, if you go to China, if you go to China this summer, it may have dampened because I think the panic will dampen and people will realize this is not a containable, have realized this is not a containable disease. So these quarantines don't make sense uh, because they, they are very uh, resource heavy from a public health perspective. Cause you've got to monitor those people. You've got to feed them. You've got to house them. You've got to find a place for them to be. You got to deal with all their complaints. And that's really, taking our like very scarce public health resources during a pandemic and putting them to something that's not even doing anything except for 
satisfying a few people's needs for quarantine. So hopefully by summertime, they won't have that kind of a quarantine thing. I would, I would worry about it. And I think what, what a quarantine involves is that you're kind of stuck on an Air Force base and you've got Wi-Fi and you can watch movies and they feed you and stuff, but it's probably pretty boring. Um, and there's lots of, I, some people, what they ordered wine by a drone at one of the places. I wouldn't advise that at an Air Force base, but somebody was quarantined somewhere else and uh, they, uh, they ordered wine by a drone, which is pretty cool. And are you charged a bill? You're not charged a bill for that part of it, but but there have been some interest, interesting things where people are like getting tested and then they got charged a bill by, by the hospital. So they're trying to work that out um, because it's really bad if the government forcibly quarantines you and then you get tested and get stuck with the bill. So they are trying to fix that part. And I think I got through all of those. So now whose question was next now? I forgot. Um, now. The next person who will be asking their question is Ricardo. Ricardo, I will now unmute you and you can ask your question. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So so most of the cases now are in uh, in the northern hemisphere, right? Because of the, I think in part because it's summer in the north. So do you expect that there will be more cases now that the season seasons will change? So there will be more cases in South America and uh, Africa. Yeah. So coronaviruses have this seasonality, and we've seen it with others. So it's important to remember that there are four other coronaviruses that circulate every year and cause about twenty five percent of our our are common colds. They tend to peak in the winter and spring and then decrease in their transmission in the summer in temperate climates. So th there may be something to that, that the transmission is less in the Southern hemisphere at this point, but I do anticipate it probably will pick up as it gets colder. So I think that seasonality we're waiting to see, but if it behaves like the other coronaviruses, yeah, we should see that type of uh, a phenomenon. And it may help in the Northern hemisphere, but in the Southern hemisphere, it's gonna be rough. And remember the tropical areas don't have seasonality to the respiratory viruses. Those things circulate year round. Yeah, can I ask another one just to, so uh, more Americans, if you look at the number of cases in the U.S. now and the number of deaths in the U.S., it seems to be much larger than other countries like Germany, France, other, you know, some European countries. Uh, why do you think there has been more deaths in the U.S.? What's happened in the U.S. is we've had, we've really been uh, hamstrung by the fact that we don't have diagnostic capacity. And the CDC had very restrictive testing criteria in the beginning that you had to be you had to be from, initially the criteria was you had to be, have been in China in the last 14 days and you had to have evidence of a lower respiratory tract infection. So they would not, they would not test anybody that had mild symptoms at all, even the, the modicum of mild symptoms. So our testing has been severely constrained. And I think that's made the, the severity bias even worse in the United States. And everybody knows that because it's, and it's still that strict. Uh, it, it's, they've now expanded the number of countries and allowed some loopholes around it, but it is still very strict testing criteria by CDC because we have such a scarcity of tests. And I think that's really skewing the data. The other point is, is that we have an explosive outbreak at a, at a long-term care facility in Washington state. Remember, those are some of the most vulnerable people on, on the planet that live in those types of areas. So their mortality rate is going to be very high, no matter what, from what virus, whether it's influenza or RSV or, uh, or, or, this, or this novel coronavirus. So I suspect it will go down as we get to closer, to, as we get better testing capacity, I, I suspect that case fatality rate, rate in the United States will go down. Um, the next question comes from Rob Flitton, who asked in the chat, is it possible to guess at a time frame when there might be sufficient clarity throughout the media and society that might give the average person calls to calm down? The, the, it's very hard to predict what the media will do. I think that this has been something that they've ne they initially neglected when I was talking about it. Then nobody wanted to talk about it early on. And then, and then basically when it started to get to kind of like a fever pitch, it's become all their coverage and basically it's taken over my life. But I was trying to talk about it like in late December, nobody wanted like, what's that? What are you talking about? No, we want to talk about flesh eating bacteria. We don't want to talk about this. They didn't want to talk about anything like, like that. So I think that it's going to be hard for them to, to, to back down. I think that there are some good journalists that have been, good at trying to, to calm people down, but there's just as many that are trying to uh, really paint headlines in, a, in a, an odd way. I've even done interviews and, and the headline is completely different than what I've said. So it's, you know, what bleeds leads. And I think that it's going to take some time for them to calm down. I think that there has been some understanding now that there's community spread going on, that people are starting to understand that this is something that people are going to have to cope with and people are getting more responsible. But I can't tell you when the time frame will be, especially because we're going into an election season. And this is something that's this is just like Ebola. Ebola was such a crazy thing until the election in November, and then it went, then it went away because it's going to become something that's, become, that's an election issue. So it's very hard to tell when they'll completely back down um, 
I try to do it myself in the media, but it's, it's, a, it's a hard task. Okay. Thank you. The next question comes from Jason Crawford, who asks, in 1918, a big factor was secondary infections, especially from bacterial pneumonia. How are things different now owing to antibiotics? How does that affect the way we compare the scenarios? So one of the things that Jason's alluding to there is that in 1918, the majority of the deaths occurred from, not from the flu itself, but from secondary bacterial pneumonias that the flu predisposed people to. And remember, in 1918, there were no antibiotics. Penicillin was only discovered in the 1920s and not commercially available until the 1940s. So we had no antibiotics. Right now, so that, that was the major issue that people, people thought about. So with the coronavirus, right now, we're actually not seeing that many secondary bacterial infections. The people who are dying of this coronavirus are dying of what's called primary viral pneumonia that the virus itself is causing the pneumonia. There have been some secondary infections and many patients are getting treated with antibiotics, but uh, it, it seems to be less of a problem than it was in 1918. I do think that there, there, there we have antibiotics and treat secondary infections when they occur because they will occur, maybe just not in the majority of patients. But, they, but it is something that we worry increasingly about because of the pipeline of antibiotics being kind of thin and the fact that many antibiotics are manufactured in India and China and our supply lines might not be uh, very robust, especially in China. So I think it's something to watch, but luckily so far, there haven't been many secondary infections. All right, what's next? The next question comes from Dan, who asks, uh, some experts recommend not gathering in groups or traveling if you're older than 65. Do you agree? I do think if you're above 60, 65, that you have to really think about your, your uh, interactions with other people and, and try and at least be very mindful of it. I don't think that people should completely destroy their quality of life over this. So I think each person has a risk aversion, has a level of risk. But I do think if you're elderly, at least you should think about that because that's where the severe illnesses and deaths are are clustering and there have been recommendations that that if you're above a certain age above 60 or so that you should try and, and stay home as much and maybe not think about using public transit but i think that that's not i think you have to take in the context of a person's life there are other health problems and and if they're if they're a healthy 65 year old it's very different than a sickly 65 year old and if this is something you really want to do and then i wouldn't i wouldn't stand in the way of someone doing it i just think you have to be accept that risk Uh, asks a similar question, uh, one that is more specific. She says, my 80 to 85 year old parents are considering traveling next week on a direct flight from Montreal to Baltimore. Should they fly, drive, cancel travel? So that's a hard question. I think that it's important if, if they're very, that at that age, great age group, you have a very high mortality rate if you get infected with this. I think that's something that they have to specifically individually decide to do. I might, I think they would be safer driving in terms of exposure to individual, exposure to individuals because you're not going to have as many contacts. If they're really meticulous with their hand hygiene and, and uh, they're probably going to be okay, but it, it's often, it's, it's risky to do that. I've been flying um, this past week and I've not been nervous or scared, but I'm not 85 years old. So I think if, if they're able to drive, it might be, uh, it might be a little safer thing to, to do. Um, but I don't know how good they, how easy it is to take that, that drive and if that's more cumbersome than actually flying. So I'm not sure uh, how that is. But I would say in general, if you're that elderly, you probably should at least think twice about uh, public transit, like in, including airplane, airplanes. I think that Dan has another question. Um, he wrote in the chat, why is there no actual when there is no actual cure, why is it so important to test? It's important to test so we can have some idea of what the community spread is going on. And you want to make sure, remember, the, the symptoms of this are overlap so much with influenza and other illnesses. What if, and there are treatments for other diseases. So you don't want to just assume that everybody has this coronavirus. You want to know what they actually have and then treat them accordingly. But I do think that increased testing will actually help decrease the panic because you're going to find more mild cases. It's going to bring down the case fatality ratio and people will get a better understanding of what's going on. And if you know it's in your community, you're less likely to see local governments 
do kind of disruptive things. So like, for example, in San Antonio, they're like banning lots of people. Anybody that's been in a quarantine, even after the quarantine period is not allowed into San Antonio forever, I guess, is basically what the, what the order is written like. So these kind of irrational actions, I think will start to go away when people learn that this isn't something that they're gonna keep out of their, <clears throat> out of their community. So that's, that's one, one important thing. And I do think it's really important just to have a picture of how this is spreading and to help doctors know how to treat these patients. And you do need to isolate some of these patients if they get hospitalized. You don't want them spreading this around the hospital. Um, so I have a question regarding the, the R0 rate, which is the, the transmission rate. I've been reading a lot of different statistics that range from anywhere from three to seven, which means that like one infected person transmits it anywhere to anywhere between three and seven people. Do you know why there's such a large discrepancy in those numbers? Sure. So this is an important concept to understand. Hopefully that I can demystify the R0. The R um, this is a, a parameter for those people who, who don't know that much about it that we calculate for certain infectious diseases. So in general terms, in broad terms, if an, R not, if an R0 is less than one, that means you transmit it to less than one person. So that's not a sustainable infection. Zero, it's not communicable between human to human. Then you have, if it's above one, it can spread to other people. And that's, that's kind of where we, that's the, like the threshold. That's a sustainable type of infection. But it's important to know that the R0 is some, not some mystical intrinsic number to the virus or the bacteria. This has to do a lot with the context. So you can have a person with the same, two different people with the same infection, and one person's R0 is 15 if they're like typhoid Mary, and one is zero if they, don't, if they actually follow instructions. So it has a lot to do with the behavior of the person as well as, the, as well as what the pathogen is. And it's an average. It's not an actual physical, it's not some straight number. And so I find that lots of modelers, mathematical modelers, love to get very obsessed about the R0 and make the, put them into a, into a computer model and come out with these, these scenarios of horrible death and destruction type of thing. But I don't know that we, we know enough that, 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 that that's a very valid way of using the R0. This is how I think of the R0. I think either it's less than, it's less than one and I don't have to worry about it. It's like in the one to three-ish range where a flu and a whole bunch of other things are raised. Or it's in the measles range, which is like 15, or the pertussis, whooping cough range is like 15. I think it's better to think of this r knots in that way, in three big buckets, than to actually worry, worry about the exact number. Is it 2.8 or is it 3.1? Because I don't think that there's any way to, to know that. It's, a, it's, not some, it's not an exact number. It's just, I think, a, a ballpark way of thinking how contagious are things on their own. And it can be influenced completely by the individual's behavior because we have what are called super spreading events where there are certain people who disproportionately affect a lot of other people. So typhoid Mary is the most famous super spreader, but there were super spreading events in SARS, there's been super spreading events in HIV. So that's, that's really what, what, how, to, how to think about it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't pay much attention to know if it's 3.1 or this or that, just know it's kind of in that middle range. It's, not, it's above one and it's not like measles. That's how I would think about it for the general public. I think it gets put into mathematical models and, and then you get all kinds of craziness of people really nitpicking over things that you can't actually figure out. If that makes sense. Yes, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, we've gotten a few more questions in the chat. Uh, so the next question is again from Rob who asks, uh, I perceive it as more risky to wash your hands in heavily used public bathrooms. Is this irrational? Depends on what you touch. Obviously, many people in a public restroom will then touch the doorknob going out. Um, and so it could be, you could recontaminate your hands uh, more. Um, so, so I think you kind of have to take your own risk thing. I, you know, I'm not, I don't get very like compulsive about all of this stuff. I kind of just wash my hands regularly and that's, that's what I do. But yeah, technically, public bathrooms are obviously going to have lots of other things going on inside them. And you're going, not the same thing as using your own sink or using alcohol hand sanitizer in your pocket. Uh, but I think you have to kind of, take a lot of that with a grain of salt because it's all about how much inconvenience you want to give yourself and how, how, how worried you are about that. And uh, the next question is from Dan who wants to know, do you think this will make it more likely that our country will consider doing something to make us less likely to rely on China for our drug supply? 
So that's an interesting question. So in my work a long time ago, maybe not long, like in 2011, 2012, I started thinking about this, but not necessarily for a pandemic, but I was thinking we had certain antibiotics that were needed for national security reasons because I spent a lot of time thinking about bioterrorism and anthrax. And, and I thought, this is interesting because many of our antibiotics that we would use against an anthrax attack are made outside the United States. What would happen if there was a supply shock at the same time? And I wanted to do a project just trying to trace back a couple different important antibiotics. And I got no interest in it. Um, people didn't really want to look into that. Now it's become a major issue because we do have a proper supply shock go, that likely will happen. And there have been, there's already been at least one drug shortage, uh, but they're not revealing the name of the drug that, uh, that's been reported because of the, the shutdown in Wuhan and Hubei province. So I do think that, especially in this environment right now of nationalism and protectionism, that there have been people that have thought about this, thinking that we need to make more things, at least with with duplicative supply chains or have more U.S. capacity for some of this because we can't even make penicillin in the United States anymore. We don't have a, a factory for it. So I think that people are thinking about this from a national security standpoint, that there are certain medications that might cross a threshold that, that may, may be of importance to be made in the United States, just like there are certain weapon systems that only can be made in the United States. And I don't know where you draw that line and which antibiotics are, are the best ones to put that there, there. but there clearly, are antibi there clearly are certain medications that have national security importance, especially for, for certain infectious diseases. I don't know that, I don't know how, I, which one, which ones you don't, but I do think that there are definitely F commerce secretary said this is going to bring some jobs back to the United States. So some people are actually using it for their own protectionist types of um, uh, protectionist ideas. But I don't, but I do think that there is going to likely be some kind of looking at supply chains that happens after this and, and maybe some effort to try and uh, encourage people to make certain antibiotics and certain medicines in the United States or, or, or at least have more duplicative change because they might have more than one manufacturer that they buy from, but they're all in China or they're all in India. And I think they're getting really nervous because some of those countries are going to enact export restrictions. So those they're not even going to be able to allow those things to leave their country. So it's not just that we want to have that capacity, but it's also some of those other countries get protectionists and don't let things go, go away, uh, be exported. So during 2009 H1N1, Australia wouldn't let their flu vaccine be exported until their whole, until their whole country was vaccinated. And that's something that you're going to have to deal with probably during this outbreak. Thank you for that perspective. Um, our next question comes from who asks, um, I have a toddler attending daycare. We are pretty much continuously sick with minor viral illnesses. Should I be concerned about our baseline compromised immunity? Kids can't stop touching their faces. Should we take our son out of daycare to limit our baseline immune stress and risk of contracting the virus? I wouldn't do that unless there's an outbreak or something going on at your, at your um, daycare. Actually, you may have a fortified immune system, paradoxically, because we know children are not really getting severe illness from this. And one of the reasons is because they get, one of the hypotheses is that they get so many other coronavirus infections, because remember, they cause so many common colds that children are always constantly exposed to coronaviruses so that they may have some cross-reactive immunity. And if you're getting exposed to those children, it probably gives you some cross-reactive immunity because you've probably seen a coronavirus uh, more, more recently than, than many other adults have. So I wouldn't take your son out of daycare unless there's an issue, a specific issue to that daycare that happens that you might want to re recover. But I wouldn't blanket to, as a blanket recommendation, uh, say to do that. And I don't think that there's an immune, I don't really think that there's a compromised immunity from getting more uh, viral infections one after the other. In most people, it's not going to have, it's not going to be a problem. People get like 2.5 colds a year. So I don't think that's a, that's an issue. This, the whole concept of immune stress, I don't think uh, applies to these types of viral uh, infections. Our next question is from Matt Bateman, who asks, looking out a year or so, what's a reasonable worst case scenario and a reasonable best case scenario? in terms of deaths, economic impact, et cetera? So this is a hard question to ask. Um, it, so there's, because not all of the scenarios are gonna be dependent upon what the virus does. Most of the scenarios are dependent upon what governments do. I think in general, what's gonna happen is at least 30 to 50% of the population is gonna become infected with this virus. The vast majority are going to have mild illness, not require hospitalization. I believe the death rate is probably going to be around 
the point zero zero point six to zero point five around that range, which is considerably higher than seasonal flu, which is point zero one. So that's going to lead in if you in the United States to maybe an additional you know several several hundred several probably in the several tens of thousands of deaths on top of what we have for flu. I, I think that's probably what the what the what the virus will do no matter what. The worst case. And it's going to be disruptive because hospitals are going, especially in the healthcare industry where hospitals run near capacity. What I think is going to happen for a while is that the worst case scenario really has to do with people emulating what China did and shutting down their countries. And we're already seeing that happen in Italy. Uh, so I think that's the worst case scenario that you have this cascade of dominoes of these countries when they get what, when they confirm widespread, widespread infection, that they shut down their economies and create all of that problem then the economic losses are going to be, remember SARS, SARS was in 2003 and it infected 8,000 people and it's estimated that it caused like 30 to $50 billion in losses. This is going to be way bigger than that. Um, and it's already bigger than that. And in many ways, I think that we're in the worst case scenario of it because of what China did and now what Italy is going to do because we're in this mentality where the, the WHO, for whatever reason, keeps sanctioning what China did. And I think that that that's going to make, and they're, asking, they're holding out China as an example, which is the strangest thing. Nobody in my field can understand what's going on at the WHO. And I think that that's, that's the worst case scenario is that we continue to have these types of restrictions. And, and then somebody tries to do that in the United States, uh, lock down a major city in the United States. That I think would be the What do we mean if the U.S. tried to do something like that? I don't know what the, the overall death rate is going to be. I think that we know that flu kills, we know it's going to be probably worse than a flu in, in terms of the number of deaths. And if you look, the last pandemic was a mild pandemic and it, it only killed like 12,000 Americans. I think this is going to kill probably more than that. Uh, I don't know how much more because we don't have enough data. Um, and I know I'm giving you like wishy-washy answers, but I don't really know the, the complete, the, the complete uh, trajectory of what's going to happen. But I think, I think you can expect 30 to 50 percent infected and a death rate around 0.5 percent. And you can kind of extrapolate from there that this is going to be uh, rough, but not cataclysmic. I hope that was helpful. I don't, it's, it's a hard question to answer in any, with any kind of certainty. Um, Matt, if you have any follow ups on that, you can go ahead and post them in the chat. Um, in the meantime, let's move on to Tyler's question. And Tyler asks, should the advice you're offering be generalized to dealing with other health risks, such as flu season for influenza or traveling to other countries in general? Are there wise precautions unique to the coronavirus? So that's a great question. And actually, no, I'm telling you all the stuff I should be telling you during flu season. It's just we don't do it. People are now, doing, people are now interested in hearing these kind of gener generic messages about flu season. No, there's nothing specific to the coronavirus. This is for all the respiratory viruses. Uh, the next question, uh, it has, Ricardo Brick has a question and his hand is up. So I will now unmute him. Yeah, so you, could you explain uh, the the time length that uh, I've seen on the media for the development of a vaccine is 12 to 18 months. So could you explain why it would take that long? And do you think that's a long amount of time? So could you just explain the, the process uh, of developing that vaccine? Like, you know, why can't they have it by next week? You know? All right. So a couple of things. So right now they are moving at very fast pace to get a vaccine. And we have technologies in 2020 that we did not have even just 10 years ago that have allowed a vaccine candidate to be made very quickly and started into clinical trials uh, basically in record time. But you have to remember that, so the technology that they're using is something called a nucleic acid vaccine. There's never been a nucleic acid vaccine before uh, for humans. And they have to go through clinical trials to understand a, you know, does it work? Does it, is it safe? Because we've not done, so is there any kind of safety signal that emerges? B, does it work? Does it actually make antibodies? C, what's the, what's the dose? How many, how many milligrams of this do you have to give? Or how many micrograms? How many doses do you have to give? What's the duration of immunity uh, that you get? So is it two, two shots, one shot? All of that has to be worked out. And you have to do it in a big enough group of people that you're going to, you're going to make sure that you're seeing side effects that might be rare, that might be 1% or 0.01%. So there's all of that effort to, to try and do a big enough clinical trial to make sure that you pick up all of that. 
before you actually want to even market it. And I don't think that this is a function of regular, it's, it's, these are actual scientific questions that need to be answered. How safe is this? What's the risk benefit ratio of this vaccine? Because if you've got a disease that is very mild, who are you going to vaccinate? Like if I get in fact, if, if you get infected and you're a healthy young person, if you're, if you're at risk, should you be vaccinated or what, what risk factor, what, um, what side effect profile would you tolerate? It's very different for you as a younger person versus an 80 year old or me as a healthcare worker who's going to be exposed to this virus. So you have to work out that kind of risk benefit analysis or the calculus of, of what side effects are appropriate for this vaccine versus what the risk of bad, bad infection is in you. So if you're, a, if you're somebody that's high risk, you're going to tolerate much higher side effects. But if you're somebody that's low risk, you might say, I'm just going to risk it because I don't want that side effect from the vaccine. But we have no baseline to know because there's no human coronavirus vaccines at all. So that has to be worked out and it takes some time and it takes the ability to recruit enough patients that you can see signals that, that to come up with that risk benefit. Then it goes to, so that, that's the main issue. And then the other issue is, is that if you think about what the quantity of this vaccine that you're going to need, this is like on flu vaccine scales, hundreds of millions, if not billions of doses, you can't make those next week. I mean, that's going to take a long time to make them. So we don't, and, and the, the leading companies, the two leading companies right now, Moderna and Innovio, do not have any ma manufacturing capacity at all. And that's a humongous problem that we have to figure out. Even if their vaccines are successful, who's going to make them? And, and they have no idea yet how they're going to do that because th these two companies are brand newish companies who have no manufacturing capacity, have never brought a vaccine to market. And there's a lot of technical, so even if you got a great vaccine, there's a lot of technical competence needed get in those vials properly there's no contaminants and do them at millions of doses so that's like something that you see like companies like Merck and, and and GSK and all these big companies like Novartis that those are the players but the big companies have kind of been burned so much with emerging infectious diseases which is another another story to tell you that they usually shy away from this stuff and it's the smaller companies that are eager and hungry to show their technology that are the first ones to jump so I do think that this is going to be 12 to 18 months we're going to get data before that but I can't, but if you're talking to like the person on the street, when are you going to get a vaccine at your doctor's office? It's going to be that, that long because we're not going to have that, that capacity. And when it comes out, it's going to be tiered just like H1N1, high risk people first, and then it's going to go, go down to, then, then it's going to be recommended for people at low risk. So I think 12 to 18 months is optimistic and it's actually fast by vaccines, vaccine scale. And if you look at Ebola, the Ebola vaccine took over 10 years to make. It just happened to be very close to being fully developed during the 2014 outbreak and they could just push it forward that last thing but vaccine the time frame of vaccines is measured in decades even without the fda issues or, or regulatory agencies it's just a hard process because you're giving something to a healthy person remember that it's not like a drug where someone's already sick you're giving this to a healthy person so the burden to give someone a vaccine take a healthy person and inject something into their body is much higher it's taken much more seriously despite what the anti-vaccine people say. This is something that's a really nuanced decision of, of when you want to, to expose somebody to something. So you have to make sure you're actually gonna benefit them when you give them that vaccine. And that takes some time to figure out. I hope that was good. Can I ask a follow-up? So uh, what is the usage of, the, of sequencing the genome? Because I think that was done like fairly quickly. Uh, what is the usage of it? The usage is that it tells you that you're dealing with something new. Uh, that you can actually identify which type of coronavirus this is. Remember, there's, there's, this is now the seventh human coronavirus. You want to see where it fits in the family. That may help you predict its behavior. You want to know what proteins, it, what proteins it makes, so that can help you with the vaccine. You need to sequence it in order to make a diagnostic test uh, because the, the, the test is specific to this coronavirus, so you need to know what the sequence is if you're going to have a diagnostic test to it. So there's really, there was really huge, uh, that was really um, a great thing that that sequence came out so quickly because it allowed diagnostic tests to be made. It allowed people to get to work quickly on a vaccine. And we could understand that this, where it fit into the family tree of coronaviruses and, and use that to sort of predict where it might, what it might do. Uh, the next two questions um, in the chat are from Jason Crawford and Tomer Ravid. Both of these questions are more so philosophical and Therefore, I'd like to save them for after six o'clock, which is when Dr. Adalja would will have to leave. Actually, I think Amish would be better able to answer so. Tomer's question than I would because uh, it's about the, what's precedented in dealing with diseases. So that oh. you have to know about the history to know that. Okay, so, so why don't we? Let's uh, go to Tomer's question in that case. 
Are the totalitarian measures taken by many Western countries right now unprecedented given the relative mildness of the COVID-19? Yes, they are unprecedented. And if you just go back to 2009 H1N1, we had an influenza pandemic and people were scared. I was legitimately worried about that in a way that I wasn't with this because it was flu and I knew what flu could do uh, in terms of 1918 and all the other pandemics that had occurred. And uh, we didn't see any of this at that time. There was quickly, people said this came from, remember just to refresh people's memory, a virus emerged in Mexico in April of 2009 and uh, President Obama was the president at that time. And there were some calls to do this type of stuff, close the border with Mexico. We wanna restrict travel. And very quickly, that was shot down saying, this is a respiratory virus spreading efficiently in the community. There is no basis for trying to contain this. So I do think that what you're seeing is an unprecedented totalitarian response, mostly because China set the tone. And it has happened in China, and they, had, and they were very embarrassed during SARS in 2003, and they did not want to be embarrassed again. So they have one tool to the Chinese government. It seems like they have one, one tool in their toolbox, and that was just basically complete control. And I think in the beginning, they thought that this was going to be a something that they could contain really quickly because it was, they thought it was animal to human and wasn't really spreading efficiently in humans. But they, that, quickly was, that, was, that assumption was quickly um, shattered. And then they thought that, that this was something that they, they, they also were very nervous. They thought it was gonna be like SARS and, and that, that it was going to be very, very fatal. And I think that they, that sort of justified their hands. And then because it wasn't, SARS has a fatality rate of at least 10%. They were, they were stuck, and I, could, I don't think they could walk that back. And it's almost as if the WHO has given them a pass for what, they, they, what they're doing. I mean, it almost looks like propaganda, some of the stuff that the WHO is saying about what happened in China, holding them out as an We do think this is dented in the modern era. You know, obviously, people did this during the Black Death, uh, and people did this. They were crazy stuff during, done during HIV uh, that didn't make sense at all. Uh, so, but in terms of the totality, no one's ever quarantined 50 million people uh, like, like the Chinese did. Uh, Dan has a follow-up to his previous question. Um, this was regarding uh, her, her child and taking him out of day daycare. Uh, so Dan wants to know, what if the parents are in the risk group? For example, if mom is pregnant and dad is type 1 diabetic, then would day should daycare be limited, or does your earlier answer stand? I do think you have, if you do have people in your household that are high risk, you have, to con you have to think about them becoming somebody being a vector to get that to them. And you have to think about that, I think, hard, whether or not uh, you would do that. I think that, I would say that, the, your, the mom being pregnant is probably less of a concern than the type 1 diabetic. Um, I don't think we know much about this being more severe in pregnant women. We know pregnant women just generally have a hard time, but I don't know that we have bad outcomes in pregnant women yet the way we do with flu. Um, but I do think you have to think about that. If there's anybody in your household or that, that has contact that, uh, that could be exposed to other people that are going out, you have to think about sort of what, what, what you want to do if people live in different areas if people so some people may limit their contact with other people but it's sometimes very obviously if you have a kid in daycare it's going to be very hard to limit their your contact with them if you're the parent so i think you got to really think about that but remember but i think it's also important to remember that this is likely going to be in many many places around the world around the country and it's going to be very hard to avoid so i think it's important to limit your social contacts but remember that it's not going to be like ironclad because this is going to likely spread very efficiently in the community The next question is from Grant Parker, who asks, what, do the steady, what does the steady state of the virus in our world look like? Will it be another seasonal flu with a yearly vaccine? What major milestones will the world have to reach to achieve steady state? Develop a vaccine, produce it at scale, etc. How long do you think that will take? So I do think the steady state is this is going to become another seasonal coronavirus. Remember again that there are four other coronaviruses that circulate every year. I think this will be the fifth one and it will have this seasonal seasonality to it. I don't think that will, and this will probably be the case unless we get a vaccine. I don't think that we'll need a yearly vaccine. I think coronaviruses are very different than flu. Remember the different families. Flu is a very tricky virus. I think hopefully what we'll have is a shot for the coronavirus, very similar to what we have for measles, where it's just one shot or two shots you get and you're, and you're done. Uh, I think that's likely what we'll have. 
the, what major milestones of the world have to reach to achieve steady state. Really, they, they, this, this vaccines, there's probably about five or six of them that are in development. They have to look good at the clinical trials. And I think that we'll have some indication of that probably within weeks to months. But that's the real issue is that, that, that a vaccine has to look good in clinical trials uh, for, to get there. But I do think we're going to be with this virus until we have a vaccine. Uh, the next two questions both come from the first one is if traveling, what are the main risk spots, airport, plane, restaurant, and what are the most important things we can do to stay safe other than washing hands and not touching faces? So we know that this virus can be, remain viable on surfaces, but that's not the main way that people are getting it. People are getting it from other individuals. They're getting, they're coughing, getting coughed on, they're getting sneezed on. That's what's happening. So there, there really isn't much other than the hand washing and not touching faces. And I think that's, I think it's a frustrating thing that that's all we have to do. Um, the main risk spots are going to be any place that there's people congregating um, in that, that you're, if, when you're traveling. And that could be in, in a, it could be anywhere in an airport. It could be on a plane. Usually in planes, remember these droplets only go about six feet. So it's usually the rows just adjacent to you that, that are at risk. If someone's in the very back coughing and sneezing and you're in the very front, it's unlikely that you're going to be exposed. So that's important to remember. Um, I think in the restaurants, it's probably less, I mean, obviously you're in a crowded bar, it's gonna be more risky than if you're sitting at a table, uh, that, that type of thing. But I think it's really hard to, to completely limit your risk. I think this is out there. And I think a lot of it is just common sense type of stuff that you can do, but it's not going to be, imper it's not going to be something that you can completely avoid. Second question is, if you are saying 30 to 50% of people will get infected, then should healthy people just go about their business and assume they will get a mild form? Or should we nevertheless take protective measures other than additional hand washing and limiting travel if older? I'm most concerned about facing rationed health care if there's a spike of acute cases, the impact on my family if one or, or more of us is sick and self-quarantined, foreign visitors coming to stay with us and not being adequately covered by their health insurance, either not being treated here or facing repatriation when sick. So I do think this is an important question. And if, if I'm answering personally, yes, I'm going about my business basically. Uh, but I, I know I'm going to get it. I, I'm in the hospital all the time. So I'm definitely going to be infected sometime. So I am going about my business and assuming I'm going to get a mild form. Hopefully by the time I get it, the, the, the strange quarantine law, things like that, will, the, quor the quarantine and self-isolation recommendations will start to go away and we'll be able to deal with this more like a flu. In terms of the recommendations for individual patients who have mild cases in terms of not, not um, because the, I guess the point is that if you're in a hospital and you get exposed and you, get, and you have to be out for 14 days, you're going to paralyze hospitals. And I wrote a piece about this, that that, that policy doesn't make any sense um, for what's going on. So I do think that people should go about their businesses business as best as they can. It's going to be difficult because local governments are going to enact really crazy things, uh, I think, is what will happen in the initial part. And I think that, uh, I, I think you, I think it's going to take some time for the general recommendation to be healthy people should just go about their business. But I think in many ways, I think it's the, it's the best way to go about this just with some common sense. And then what's next? Take protect. I, I do think we should take protective measures, um, but not, not, nothing really crazy. I wouldn't, you know, if you have a prescription medication or something like that, you might want to get an extra supply of it. If you've got issues in your town that you might, might make it hard for you to get things, you might want to have some of them on stock uh, in a uh, stockpile, maybe for one to two weeks. I, I wouldn't really do much more than that. I myself haven't done any of that. And I'm a bad example um, of people. I don't even follow my own recommendations sometimes for this type of stuff because it's sometimes hard to, 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 to follow all of that. Um, what else did you say here? I haven't limited my own travel. I would be a little bit nervous about traveling internationally, not because of the virus, but because I'm worried about getting stuck somewhere and getting, getting a quarantine order or something like that. So that's just something to keep in mind until this kind of settles down. I am most concerned about facing rationing healthcare. I, I think that there, there are definitely contingency plans for rationed healthcare. They're called crisis standards of care. We have never went there before. In 2009, H1N1, we had 61 million Americans infected within a year. Uh, 300,000 people admitted, and we didn't have to go to that. Hopefully, we don't have to go to that, but I do think that that's something we have to, to, to think about happening. Um, but I, 
most cases are going to be mild. And I think it's just going to be very crowded emergency departments and a lot of, of, of hustling in, in hospitals, but hopefully not to the ration care uh, part of that. And the ra because there's not specific treatments for this, the ration care would be for the most critically ill, whether or not they get a mechanical ventilator basically is what the issue. I think that's what we're seeing because there's not antivirals. There's not specific things out there for this yet. Um, what is this? Foreign visitors not being adequately covered. I think that that's a major issue. What will likely happen if there's a disaster declaration? And I think more increasingly it's looking like there's going to be a federal disaster declaration, like the same kind you get for a hurricane or a flood. Then the U.S. government will pay, the taxpayers will pick up the cost for every uh, of your foreign visitors who are not covered by their insurance. It's likely what will happen. I think there's a, there's a big concern, not just for that, because there's, there's so many uninsured people that people are worried about, as well as um, Right now, with the public refuge, uh, certain immigrants can't get welfare. They're well, they're getting taken off welfare rolls. So there's some, there's a lot of concern about what will happen, which I think will likely lead to a disaster declaration and and the foreign and the federal government paying for all of that through through taxpayers. I hope that answered them all. But um, our next question is from Jason Crawford, who asks. I've heard that metallic surfaces, especially copper, can have antimicrobial activity. Copper tape is cheap, and some have recommended covering, for example, doorknobs with it. Is there any credibility to this? So copper is an antimicrobial surface, and we do use them. Some, there actually are some products that are done in hospitals, like bed rails and stuff that they might try to put in copper. It's very expensive. Um, it's... It, it, it mo it's more marketed for bacteria than viruses. So I don't know how effective they will be against viruses. They're definitely effective against bacteria. It's been mostly cost prohibitive at hospitals to do it, but I don't, so I don't know if there's specific credibility of that copper tape. So I don't know exactly what the look at from the bed rails. One thing to look up might be some of those companies that make copper hospital beds and copper equipment for hospitals and see what the concentration is and see if it's com comparable to the to the tape but i i don't know if that's the i don't know how much uh, how, how worth it it is uh, for that remember the primary transmission is still going to be person to person not through doorknobs uh, even though that can occur it's going to be it's not going to be what what pushes this outbreak further uh, so there are two more questions in line from people who have already asked questions uh, i will bring cornelius to the front of the queue he asks, one complaint I've heard from doctors is that there aren't any testing kits available through public health departments. Is this just to be expected as a result of state distribution, or is there also some severe limiting factor in the production of these kits, like with the vaccine? So it's kind of both. So initially when testing was rolled out, the CDC was the first to do it. And that's often the case with the public health with an emerging infectious disease, because no one, the commercial labs don't need, don't want to make a, make something for something that may be very small and go away and not be an issue and then have a difficulty charging for it and all of that kind of stuff. So it's often they're, they're kind of shy away from something that might have a, a small market size. So for example, SARS, even though it affected 8,000 people, that's a small market compared to making a diagnostic test for HIV or, or for flu or for, or for some other disease. So they don't necessarily get involved first. So it's often deferred to the CDC and then the CDC pushes out to the public health department. The, the 50 state health labs and that got botched out botched really badly um, with a test kit that was faulty but then found not to be faulty and there was just delays pulling it putting it out there then because there was a public health emergency declared this is a kind of a complicated story so there, when you declare a public health emergency in general that allows the fda to have a lot of flexibility that they don't have to go through all their regulatory stuff for drugs and for vaccines Paradoxically, it increases regulation against diagnostics because in diagnostics, there's this category called laboratory derived tests or LDTs. So this is like if you're a big, a big lab chain like Quest or LabCorp, or you're a big university hospital like the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, you, you have the, you're considered a high complexity lab so you can make your own test and the FDA doesn't care because they, they assume you're competent to do that and it's a test that you're only using on your, your patients. But what happened with the emergency declaration is that diagnostic tests the LDT program, basically all LDTs have to go through the FDA then. And before they don't have to go through, the, they, if there was no emergency declaration, they wouldn't have to go through it. But since there's an emergency declaration, it increases regulations on something that wasn't regulated, whereas it decreases regulations on things that were regulated, like vaccines and, and antivirals, which have a quicker path to approval or a quicker path to usage. So that's what happened. And that's why you saw this big delay for Quest and LabCorp to get involved in the hospital labs to do it. Even some of the state health labs can make their own. So New York State has their own test. They're not using the CDC test. 
And now I think probably this week you'll see, you'll see Quest and LabCorp come online. It's going to take some time for the other companies that make the kit, the actual kits like Roche and all these different companies to have one that can be in your doctor's office or in the ER. It's still going to be something that goes to the main lab, but it is definitely something that, uh, that ha it's a function of the whole state apparatus. And I think that people didn't realize how this would, what would, what would happen to diagnostic tests under this type of an emergency use authorization. And they didn't realize that this was going to be such a big problem because this happened for Zika too, but they could, Zika wasn't moving at the pace that this was. So they were able to, to work through it and not see how, how constraining it would be. I do think they're going to fix this now. I don't think they, I, I think they didn't foresee what this regulation would do. I have friends at the FDA and I, I know people were freaking out what, what was happening, trying to fix it as quick as they can. But sometimes even if you're a bureaucrat, you know, you're still stick, stuck and bound by the bureaucracy and it took some time to get that to change. And uh, there were some really good heroes in this fight, including like former FDA commissioner, Scott Gottlieb, who was actually barred from talking to his former colleagues because he just came out of the FDA, but they, they fixed it pretty fast, but it was still a, a major hiccup in our response. It will be an interesting thing for an objectivist to write about. Hint to Ben, if Ben's listening. Uh, we have two more questions here in the chat. Uh, do you have time, Dr. Delja, to answer them? Yeah, I can take them really quickly. I just have to, I, I literally have to get my car and drive somewhere. In the, sure. in a minute, though, but. So when you said that 30 to 50% of the population would be infected, were you referring to the U.S. or to the world population? World population. Okay. And the other question is, uh, if this virus was supposed to have been acquired at the wild food market in China from bats or other uh, animals not eaten in our country, do you think anything can be done about that? I'm presuming uh, Dan's referring to eating wild animal game. So this likely came from wild food. So all coronaviruses circulate in bats. They're just always there. And what bats do is they spill it into other animals. So in SARS, they spilled it to a type of cat. In MERS, they spilled it to a camel, and then it gets to humans. We do know that the wild food markets in China are a major mixing ground for viruses and an easy way for viruses to jump into humans. And the Chinese government has been trying to, to do something about them because they kind of form, they actually are like a public hazard uh, for what's going on. So I do think it's almost a legitimate function when you're doing that inappropriately and all the body fluids are mixing together and then and people aren't taking safety precautions there. I think that there, there, there is a public health risk uh, with these markets. I do think that they, we, we need to do, I think you can have these wild markets that people can pick out the chicken that they want to eat or the fish or whatever it is they want to, they want to pick it out and watch it be killed. They can do that, but I think there probably should be some safety around that, just like there is safety with dealing with any kind of hazardous material. And I think that, that that's probably the best way to do it. I think that this was a single introduction. I think that there probably was one animal. We don't know what that animal was that gave it to humans. And just by chance, this virus had the capacity to spread efficiently between humans. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever figure out what that animal is, but I do think that these wild markets have to be um, something that people give more scrutiny to and kind of come up with a better, uh, like best practices or a way to do it safely. In China, I think that this is probably historically because people didn't have refrigeration and they wanted fresh food. So it actually has a real purpose, but it's now become something that's uh, increasingly been seen as a major disease spread risk. All right. Thank you. So that covers all the questions. So I'm going to sign off, but you can, but if you ever want um, to do this again, I'm happy to take more questions as this evolves, uh, or if I didn't answer anything, uh, I, I'm just uh, completely <laughs> short on time in general. Yeah. Thank you so all much right. for joining us today. I know you must be very busy with this epidemic going on. Yeah. Um, All right. Thank thanks, you. Dr. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Amy. Bye. So um, at this point, we can start the discussion of more philosophical questions related to uh, the outbreak and ways of handling it. Uh, there's one here in the chat before. Uh, I don't remember. Who... It was Jason wanted to know my views on, uh, if I have any views, on proper government role. Um, so I should say, first of all, that I'm pretty much ignorant about this. Uh, everything I know about the virus and the outbreak I got from Amish, I know from Amish from this and previous conversations, and also from what I read in the, the major newspapers. And so I'm not really in a position to speculate that much on it. Uh, I thought it would be 
uh, I mean, I think it was great that we had Amish here to do a Q&A in it, and I thought my role would be reacting if any philosophical issues came up, but it would be better, uh, the, the timing didn't work out as I anticipated, but it would be better if I could do it with him on the line and we could hash things out together. So uh, I'll say this much about what um, public, what the legitimate government functions are. I think first you have to distinguish between a proper government that is one that's limited to its proper functions and then how it should deal with pandemics. And the other, which is a, a good question and a question that will need to be worked out once we get governments that stay within their proper realms. But I think it's a separate question. What would be the proper thing for existing governments to do? Uh, existing governments, which are not by my light proper uh, with respect to what things they take into their ambit and don't. Basically every country in the world, including America has a socialized healthcare system. Um, we, and I don't just mean Obamacare, I mean um, Medicare is socialized health care for old people, and old people are most of the people who are sick, and most of the people who are at risk for most, uh, 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 or the worst complications for most viruses. And uh, that's completely government controlled, and has been since the mid-60s, and it totally shapes the whole way the healthcare system works, right? So we have a kind of socialized medicine here, or a variant of socialized medicine here. There were different variants of socialized or controlled medicine in governmentally controlled medicine in all different countries. And so if you're asked saying, you know, the government should stay out of it, well, they're not out of it. They're already in it. Every aspect of this industry is shaped by government, uh, governments controlling, setting policies, etc. cetera. And uh, one question is how it would work if they didn't, and would that be better? And the other question is, given that they do, what do they need to do when we have a, a, a pandemic situation like this? So on the second kind of question, what do they need to do when we have a pandemic situation like this? I think if you're not a medical expert, if you're not an expert on the particular risks, you have to defer to the medical experts. And if you're going to, th to think philosophically about it or think about it from an issue of political philosophy, you need to do it with, with a like-minded expert uh, in tow. So I'm not going to say um, the government shouldn't make vaccine or it should make vaccine or it should do this. I, I would say it should try to decontrol de in what ways it can. It should try to allow there to be as much freedom as possible and, and loosen up the reins. But I would want to be talking to Amesh or to somebody about what are exactly the facts on the ground. Uh, in what ways in particular is the system functioning now, which is this weird public-private hybrid system. And you have to have all of that information in line to make policy recommendations. So you can't do it deducing it down from philosophy. You have to have a lot of information about how the system is functioning now to make recommendations about what will be going on now. And so you need not just a doctor, but a doctor who, um, it wouldn't have to be a doctor, but somebody who really understands exactly how this segment of the economy is functioning right now. Um, it's just like, you know, if you, um, why don't you give the other, the other example. Now, as to uh, what are the proper functions of a government with respect to public health in general? I think the quarantine function is absolutely legitimate and other functions like that uh, are legitimate. The way to think about it is governments deal in force. Their proper role is force and not production. And the question is anything that it would be reasonable for individuals to do by force if there wasn't a government uh, is the proper function of the government to take it over. So, for example, if we're in some kind of, you know, primitive times, Armageddon comes, the, this virus kills everybody, and we're in some apocalyptic world, uh, and people are approaching you who look like they have it, um, you would be justified in, you know, building a fortification and having a gun and saying, don't get any closer, we're worried this is going to spread to us, and so we're then using force to keep you apart from the people who might have the virus, or to keep the people who might have the virus, you know, in a certain place, if it's if it's a situation where the virus is likely to spread and be lethal to you, if, or very dangerous to you if it gets to you, and if those kind of measures of forcibly separating people have a realistic hope of containing it, uh, and since that would be proper for individuals to do in that situation, uh, but it's not proper for individuals to wield force 
uh, unilaterally in a society, that's then a function that has to be taken over by the government. And so quarantining, some kind of testing that's necessary to facilitate quarantining, and things like that would all be appropriate functions for the government. But it would have to be both um, that the virus is risky enough, that it's a, a serious threat to somebody's uh, life or lo life or quality of life, if they get it, two. Three, that it's very contagious. And four, that it's not so contagious that it's ridiculous and these things won't help anyway. And what I understand um, from Amish and from others is that in the case of this virus, we're really in that last, uh, that last uh, category. There was no reason to think that travel bans and quarantines were going to help, apparently. Um, be, why? Because the virus would have already, it's like, you know, uh, closing the door after the cat has escaped. It's already gone. Uh, it's already gotten to all the other places by the time these quarantines were imposed. And so, at least so people like Hamish are saying, um, the quarantines wouldn't help. And you have to know that, are you really in a situation like that? Is this something that is realistically containable? If it is realistically containable and it's a real threat, then I think uh, realistically containable by quarantines and such programs, then I think the government has a, a real role, a, a realistic role in doing that, but not a role in developing the defenses and so forth against it. That is the, the vaccines, the uh, antivirals or whatever the, the medicines might be. Um, in this case, it's apparently not something that there was any realistic hope of combating or containing that way. And so if that's true, that it was wrong for the government of China and for U.S. government to suggest and for the northern for government uh, of Italy to basically block that lockdown northern Italy. Uh, that was an improper response. If again the medical factor, as uh, I understand them to be, and it's seemingly largely because of that that the stock market, uh, you know, tumbled and we had uh, all the problems we've been having. Um, so uh, the other issue is then what should how should, um, through non-governmental means, uh, how should through private agency responses to this come about? Well, I think it, it's a premature, you're, if you're imagining a, a world in which medical care is free, not free like free beer, but free like free speech, that is not controlled by force by the government, then you're imagining a whole, a world in which there's a whole different kind of infrastructure developed to deal with these questions and uh, we're not there. So what it is, what's for a philosopher to talk about is how it could function, uh, but it's for the particular business people and service providers and medical professionals who would exist in under political freedom to develop those technologies, that infrastructure and, uh, and um, you know, we don't have it. I'm sorry, my camera's going in now. So that's, uh, all I have to say here, the, the primary thing to say on a philosophical, on philosophical grounds is to know the limitations of what you can say just from philosophy without having actual expertise in the nature of this particular uh, virus. Um, so should I, uh, go ahead, Alex. It looks like Ricardo is next. Okay. Uh, Ricardo, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, so I just uh, I just want to clarify something on the nature of government. So like making a direct reference to that essay by uh, Ayn Rand. So she only talks about essentially the police, uh, the military and the court system. Right? So should something like the CDC exist, not, not in the way that the CDC exists today, but something that would be a, a government agency that would be there just for emergencies such as this? Like should that be a thing that it exists? Or should it be something that the government summons? You know, if you have like 10 major companies, you know, it will summon a representative or something like that. Well, in part, that's a question of what's involved in, um, in fighting infectious disease. So if you think about the borderline between fighting infectious disease by force and fighting infectious disease through voluntary productive means, right? Infectious disease is fought through voluntary productive means when people buy masks, develop vaccines, you know, all the kind of normal thing. It's, it's the, the role of force here is um, if people have to be kept away from one another, 
when they won't voluntarily do it. So one question is how often does that need arise? How often are we in a situation where um, uh, some kind of quarantine power ought to be invoked? And then how do we find out when we're in the situation that it ought to be invoked? So if it's something that you know should happen once every thousand years or 600 years, it's very, very rare, very, very unlikely. Um, then I don't think we need a standing government body to deal with it. Um, if, on the other hand, it's something that is going to happen um, every, you know, 10 years, then I think not only do we need the government uh, to have the infrastructure to deal with it when it comes up every 10 years, but we also need uh, some organization that's monitoring what diseases are about now and so forth so that we could tell whether we're in that situation. Um, and um, again, this is a kind of question that you need to think both philosophically and about what we know about the concrete to think about it. So kinds of examples like um, if you go back to uh, the Ellis Island period, right, there were a bunch of known very communicable diseases that were relatively well contained. Um, and so there was quarantine on Ellis Island, right? So when people came to America, they would come, we would keep them there for a certain amount of time, see if they have tuberculosis or whatever, and then they would come out. And I think that, again, pending how exactly the, the, the biology works of it, that kind of thing seems to be reasonable. And if we're in a situation where there are diseases like that, diseases that are containable, that can be kept out of the general population by those kind of measures, and they're ongoing, so that you know, we know there are 10 of them and, and you have to keep people for 10 days and they don't get this one or whatever, then uh, I think there's a, a need for a government organization that does that. It could be part of the police or part of the immigration authority, uh, which essentially is part of the police and military. Um, and that would be perfectly reasonable. We're, we now seem to be in a situation where there aren't diseases that are known diseases that are common but easily controllable by quarantine measures. There um, is my understanding, maybe there are some I don't know about. Um, and these questions come up only when we're in, in pandemics and so forth, in, in new novel things coming up. Um, I think there probably would be some need for the government to be monitoring this, but I think if the healthcare system was private to begin with, a lot of these things would be being done by companies, by insurance companies, by medical associations, which uh, have been sort of denuded by the fact that a lot of the functions have been socialized, but would have to exist as their own organizations. And then I would assume that the government's job would be to have, you know, a couple of, of a small, relatively small office that's corresponding with the existing market-based medical establishment and uh, as it would with other industries. But, um, if we're in a world where there's, you know, for example, um, TB spreading all over the place and there are known things to do to com combat it, you could imagine there being a TB department or whatever that was dealing with that. Um, it looks like the next uh, two questions are coming from Professor D, who asks, I've heard Dr. Yaron Brook say that the government has the right to protect its citizens from criminals, invasions, and infectious diseases. They are currently holding a cruise ship from docking in Port Everglades near Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Some people on the news feel this isn't the moral thing to do. What is the objectivist position regarding all travelers suspected to have been exposed to coronavirus under quarantine? So I don't think there can be an, an, the objectivist position on that because it's, um, it's not a philosophical question. You have to know about the science of this particular um, disease. So, um, so it, it's not philosophy. What, what philosophy could say is under what kind of circumstances would that kind of a quarantine be necessary or proper? And, um, and then you need a doctors to tell you, are, are the current facts such that we're in that kind of a situation? So if you had a, a, a cruise ship with bubonic plague on it, or uh, you know, something like that, that could be, uh, it's, that's not gonna exist. But if you had a cruise ship full of people 
with uh, smallpox. There wasn't smallpox uh, in the wild anywhere else in the world. But you imagine a science fiction scenario. There's smallpox in a lab somewhere. Uh, for some reason, it's being transported on a cruise ship and the vial breaks. And now everybody on the cruise ship or a lot of them have smallpox, but nobody on shore has smallpox and so forth. Yeah, what we should do is not let that cruise ship dock or else it should be let to dock in some specialized medical facility where people in hazmat suits come on and deal with them. And the people oughtn't to be let to mix with the general population because, you know, uh, until that's dealt with. But the, my understanding is that we're not in anything like the situation like that with this current cruise ship because um, already the coronavirus is all over the damn place that this COVID-19 COVID virus is all over the damn place. And it's not such that by stopping this cruise ship, we're going to prevent it from getting into Miami. It's already in Miami. At least that's the best uh, projection. And if it's not in Miami, it's two towns over and we'll make it there. So if that's true, uh, if it's the kind of thing that it already is it's in the cards that 30 to 50% of people are going to get it because it's spreading rapidly throughout the population, it's already here, then there's no reason to be um, terrified of these people on this cruise ship and keep this cruise ship locked up and, and, and it, would be, uh, it would be wrong. It would be wrong because it's uh, not because there isn't a legitimate government power to do that if we were in a certain kind of situation, but because it's, we're not in that situation and we're in a, what, what's happening is that there's a panic where people are perceiving the risks way out of whack and imagining we're in a situation that's very different from the situation we're really in. And if that is indeed what's going on here, then yeah, they should let the ship dock and they should uh, you know, test the people and treat it like uh, you know, um, you know, may maybe quarantine them, but probably not even that. Just, you know, get them tests, tell them to stay at home and uh uh deal with it that way. Uh, Professor Diaz, by extension, do we have the right to call the police or any government agency to protect us from criminals? <clears throat> then we should have the right to have, call the police to have a person suspected of having coronavirus removed from our place at work or any other public building. Um, yes, in a way, but you ha if it's a case where the, the quarantine power is really justified. But... Um, Let's think about this realistically. First of all, you don't have the right to call the police uh, um, and claim someone's a criminal on, you know, I don't like the look of him, you know, whatever. His fingernails are too long or whatever. He must be a criminal. Come arrest him. You have to have actual reasons. Now, if the person is in your, on your property, right, you don't have to, you can just say, I want you to leave my property. If he doesn't leave your property, he's trespassing. And whether you think he's got the coronavirus or you don't like the look of him or whatever it is, you know, he's not allowed to do that. You can call the police to get him to leave. Uh, so I'll, I'll be, getting someone off your property, you should be able to get the police to help you do if they won't leave voluntarily, regardless of whether you think they have the coronavirus. Now, the, the relevant thing wouldn't be getting them off your property, but if there's somebody who is um, really posing a threat to other people by walking around uh, and engaging in his whatever activities he's engaging in, and if he's not doing it on your property, but you know that he's doing this, he's going around coughing wherever he goes or so forth and spreading this virus, yeah, then a, a virus that is really deadly and um, wouldn't otherwise be in the, in the vicinity and so forth. That's the kind of case where the quarantine power is justified. And you would be justified in calling up the police and saying, I know this, I know typhoid Mary and she's cooking again, you know, and then they would come and, and have to quarantine her. But it would have to be a case like that. And it doesn't seem like there were cases like that with the, the coronavirus or this coronavirus. Because it's spreading anyway. And so it's not, you need a case where it's, it's a, discrete set of actions that it's possible not to take and this guy's taking them anyway and recklessly endangering people by doing it. Uh, you're welcome, Professor D. All right. Uh, any other questions? Bearing in mind that I don't know what I'm talking about here since Amos is left. 
but I can just give some thought on how to think about this kind of case generally. Here's a thought. <clears throat> I mean, one issue that we should all be aware of is that, that I think this, this situation makes clear as an issue, but I think there are many situations that come up. Um, it matters that the people in our government are rational, care what's true, um, are concerned about reality rather than just appearances, and uh, that they be more concerned about reality and less concerned about appearances when there is some differential, since no politicians are as concerned about reality as we would like them to be. Um, there's a kind of rhetoric you could have, particularly if you're somebody who has a philosophical view that thinks the government should be very different from it is, how it is, that, well, it doesn't matter who's in charge, it doesn't matter, all these people are bastards, they're all awful, and every, you know, uh, burn it all down, one scumbag's as bad as the next, and so forth. Um, and I think that's really a mistake. There are things that a government is doing that it ought to be doing, and there are things that it oughtn't to be doing, but it is doing them, and uh, it, how well our lives go, uh, it matters whether they're done well or poorly. Uh, and given all of that, um, we should think in making our political decisions about who we think is going to handle them better. Uh, and we should think about this not just, you know, who you vote for for different offices, and, and in your general take on political advocacy. It's not like we either get to the ideal world or uh, the, you know, we get to the ideal society that we want with government doing all and only the things we think it should. Or we don't, and then it doesn't matter how the government runs. No countries now have the kind of government that I think there should be, doing all and only the things I think it should do. But some countries are a lot better, have a lot better governments than others. Uh, America's is a lot better than China's, for example. Uh, and um, seemingly so far than Italy's, right? So, uh, though Italy's is better than China's. So it, it matters a great deal uh, to, you know, how likely you are to die, for example, or how likely you are to get stranded in a country when you go traveling and not be able to carry on your life. Uh, who is running the government, how the different offices are functioning, uh, how politicized various issues are treated uh, versus there being a kind of firewall between politics and decision-making in different fields. All of these things kind of matter, and one ought to be thinking about them as one advocates in politics and as one makes decisions about, you know, particular voting, advocating on particular issues. It's not all, do we get laissez-faire capitalism or not, and if we don't, it's six of one, a half dozen of another. Uh, who's running the CDC, for example, could keep you alive or kill you, given that there is a CDC.